Hello, and welcome to my beginner grease pencil blender tutorial. I am very excited for this because uh, the original reason I got into using Blender was Grease Pencil. I kind of ended up getting sucked into the 3D stuff as I went along, but Grease Pencil is still super fun to work in, and I feel like it's a super underrated feature in Blender, and I want to talk about it a little bit more. Um, this is just going to be a basic introduction to the tool. I'm not going to give you a full rundown of how to get into Blender, or how to uh, do 3D stuff, or how to get into animation necessarily. This is more so going to be focused on just using Grease Pencil as an illustration tool, because uh, there's a lot of fun stuff you can do with it, even if you're not necessarily using it to make like a cartoon, or if you're not trying to incorporate a bunch of 3D stuff in it as well. There's still a lot of cool stuff. I even have some super secret tips that I haven't really seen a lot of people talking about and I haven't shared anywhere else yet except for maybe a couple people that DM me about stuff. So stick around if you want to see some cool tips that I wish I knew when I had first started using Grease Pencil. In this video I'm going to cover some basics about navigating in the viewport in Blender. Uh, just for the sake of illustration, this can be one of the scariest things when you're just using Blender and I want this to be an accessible tutorial for people that are just downloading Blender. Then I'll cover the basic settings and features of Grease Pencil objects in Blender. Then I'll show you the basic techniques for drawing in Blender, and we'll cover some of those secret tips I have as they come up in the basics of the video. And this probably goes without saying, but make sure you have Blender downloaded before we go further in the tutorial. Uh, there's a couple other downloads that I'll bring up in the video, but they're not 100% required. This is the only required download. <laughs> Blender 3.6.1 recently came out, and it's going to be the last release until Blender 4.0 comes out. But uh, a lot of the updates have been pretty marginal for Grease Pencil. Uh, if you have Blender like 3.1 or 3.2, uh, Grease Pencil really hasn't changed a lot over the last few updates. So you can just stick with that. Don't worry about downloading any new versions of Blender. Um, but if you do want to go download Blender 3.6, everything I'm going to talk about in this tutorial should still apply pretty much the same. And once you have Blender open, you're going to see a splash screen that has a few default new files that we can choose. Uh, since this is a Grease Pencil tutorial, we're going to click 2D Animation under the New Files. And I actually have a different startup file save, so mine opens to a, a window that already has a bunch of settings that I like, um, which you can download this startup file for yourself if you want to check out my Patreon. It'll be up there for free. But I'm going to go ahead and switch my settings so that it should look like what your screen looks like right now. So it should just be this white canvas and uh, let me just go over and turn on my screencast keys. Okay, so this is what your viewport in Blender should look like upon opening up and loading the 2D animation default file. Uh, you'll see that we have a blank canvas here similar to any other drawing program. Uh, and then we have all these toolbars over here on the left and you have your menus up at the top similar to pretty much any program you'd work in. But then there's like a billion other menus and they all have a lot of buttons on them. And uh, it can be very scary upon first opening. Uh, but I'm going to try to break it all down as simple as possible just for the sake of drawing in Blender. Um, and that's going to start with us moving the camera around. So before we get into moving the camera around too much, if you're drawing on a drawing tablet, it might benefit you to map some key on your pen or on your tablet to the middle click uh, button because that is the main uh, click that controls your camera. Or you go to Edit Preferences and go into input where you can emulate three button mouse. Now this is what I do. Um, you could also just map the three button mouse like the middle click to your pen like on the front button or something uh, and that'll work fine for you as well. Um, but I like to emulate three button mouse and what that's going to do is it lets you hold alt and whenever you're holding alt on your keyboard it'll make your left click just your regular dragging around of your mouse that'll count as a middle click. Uh, another good setting to have on is emulate numpad. If you don't have a numpad, um, numpad is really important for uh, reassigning where your camera is in the viewport. Um, so if you accidentally move your camera around you can just press zero and that'll reset your camera back to the original camera view position. Uh, other than that, I like to have tab for pie menu and pie menu on drag on. Um, that's kind of the quickest way that I've found for navigating between different modes. But anyways, now with those settings out of the way, we can go ahead and start moving our camera around. Uh, this is not the goal of Grease Pencil. <laughs> like if you're just using it for illustration, uh, you generally don't want to move your camera around a lot, but it happens. The most typical way you want to move your camera around is by holding shift and alt and then you just click around and that lets you pan your screen around. Um, if you want to zoom in, you just use the scroll wheel 
and then you can pan if you want to zoom in on something. Um, but if you accidentally are just holding Alt and not any other modifier, then you're going to see that our camera starts orbiting around in 3D. And this is fine if you want to use Grease Pencil in a more 3D application, like if you're trying to draw on top of objects or if you're trying to create sort of a sculpture of drawing. Um, you know, this would be very natural. But if you're just using it for illustration and you accidentally get into this view and you're like, how, do, how the heck do I get back? This is where using the numpad is super helpful. And if you have emulate numpad, it works the same. But you just press zero and that brings you back to camera view. So numpad zero or just the regular zero key. And you can flip back to wherever you were in 3D space by just pressing zero again. Like I was saying earlier, use the scroll wheel to zoom in and out. Alternatively, you could hold control and middle click or alt if you're using a pen and that lets you zoom in uh, by by dragging your mouse around and that's pretty much the basics of moving your camera around um that's kind of the scariest thing about when you're just using blender is you might accidentally hit a button and then you're like oh heck where is my camera i don't know where i am uh, just pressing zero is the easiest thing you can do to make sure that you're back where you need to be with your camera now that we know how to move our camera around in blender we can go over the basics of grease pencil objects now the two fundamentals of these objects are layers and materials now layers are similar to like Photoshop layers where you have kind of a stack of images that stack on top of each other and you can draw on each one of them and edit each one of them individually. Uh, in Blender, they're a bit more cohesive. Now when you open Blender for the first time in 2D animation mode, we'll already have our layers menu over here on the right and we'll see if we have one layer called lines and fills. And if you click on either one of them, you'll see they have a bunch of settings under them that are unique to each layer. One of those being use lights. Now personally, I like to turn use lights off because I generally am not using lighting techniques when I'm working in a grease pencil. But if you were, you know, adding lights, you can get some pretty cool gradient effects. It's just not something that I like to do. And it can end up kind of getting some weird color variations if you're trying to use the color picker and trying to have color consistency. So I like to keep it off whenever I'm working in a grease pencil. On to the second fundamental of grease pencil objects is the materials, which we can access by going to the menu just under our currently selected object data property. I didn't even realize it was called data. I thought it would be called layers. <laughs> um, if we go to the, the menu under that, we'll see our material menu. And this is already going to have four materials on it, one of those being a solid stroke. And if we select that, you'll see this is the basic uh, pencil tool that we start with in draw mode. And we select the square stroke. You'll see it's kind of layering these super tiny squares all along the stroke. This can be a cool tool if you're trying to get texture on your, your illustrations. If you select the solid fill material in draw mode, you'll see you can still draw with it just like a pencil, except it fills in the area within the bounds of the vertices that you lay with the stroke. So if you just draw a line, you're not gonna see much, but if you draw a circle, you'll see that it fills in the entire area inside the circle. And then the dot stroke is pretty much the same. These are just the default materials that come in the, the base 2D animation file, but there's lots of other cool uh, strokes and brushes and materials that you can download. The community has a lot of really cool custom made materials that you can get for free that I'll have linked in the description. For this tutorial, we're just gonna stick with what is in Base Blender because that's what I use when I'm illustrating. Uh, and there's still a lot of cool stuff that you can do with it without going and downloading a bunch of stuff. Now that we have a grasp on the layers and materials, I can go ahead and run you guys through all the different modes that there are in Blender. Um, the, these will be unique depending on the type of object you're working with. Um, like if you're working with uh, an actual 3D mesh, it's gonna have different tools than the kind of modes that grease pencil objects will have. So with our grease pencil object selected, uh, if we're in draw mode and you have the tab for pie menu open, if you hit tab and drag your mouse, it's gonna open this little pie menu of a bunch of different modes. And one of them is object mode. Um, I think Worthy Kids called this like an overworld for Blender, which is a really good um, analogy for that. It's basically the, the base level of Blender. It's like what you would start in in 3D mode and it lets you switch between objects or jump between editing your camera to editing grease pencil to doing all kinds of things adding new objects um, this is like the base level that lets you manipulate stuff on an object level in blender so like our, if you look up in our scene collection you'll see we have two objects right now one of those being our stroke which is our little drawing here and then the second being camera uh, and, and in object mode you can do all kinds of things to these objects if i'm moving around in 3d if I hit G with my camera selected, you'll see I can move my camera around in 3D space. And if I switch back to camera view, you'll see my camera got moved pretty far off. Uh, but this is usually something that we'd apply to our drawing. Like if we want to grab this drawing and move it around, just hitting G in object mode lets us do that. 
Um, you can also scale objects up, say this drawing's too big, just hit S and that lets us scale it down. Um, alternatively, we can rotate our object. And whenever you're rotating something in Grease Pencil, it's generally just going to rotate from the view that you're looking at it from. But if you see, if we wanted to do something more in 3D, you'd see that it's going to rotate based on the axis of our view, our viewport. So if we're looking at it from the side, it's going to rotate it as if, you know, the, the orientation's from the side. Um, but for our purposes, we're going to stick in the camera view and it will be able to rotate stuff like this. Other than editing things in object mode, you can also add new objects. So if we want to hit shift A, that brings up this little menu where we can add objects. Alternatively, you hit the add menu up here, but I, I generally just hit shift A and then you can see grease pencil. If we want to add a blank, we'll have a new grease pencil object that's going to open up a whole new menu with the basic black material and just one GP layer for grease pencil layer in the layers menu. We're not going to need to add any more grease pencil objects right now, but it can be really useful for if you're making a illustration that has a lot of different effects that you don't want to apply to every single element in your illustration. You can just put those different elements on different grease pencil objects, and that allows you to have more control over the effects on uh, particular elements in your illustration. Now if we switch to edit mode by holding tab and dragging our mouse to the right, you'll see that it lights up our strokes kind of with a white outline, and if you select them, you'll see that you can grab our strokes similar to in object mode. We can scale them up, rotate them. And a really cool thing that you can do in edit mode is by hitting O, you can turn on proportional editing, which is controlled by this button up here. And that allows us to proportionally edit everything in our scene or in this object based on the particular uh, strokes that we have selected. And you can use a scroll wheel to change the intensity of that. With certain strokes selected, you can also press X to delete them. And when you're scaling an object, you can press X, Y, or Z to change the orientation that you're scaling it on. So if we scale it on the X axis, you see it's like that. The Y axis isn't gonna do anything because guess what, the Y axis is going right at you. <laughs> if it's a flat plane, you can't scale it forwards and backwards. It's only gonna be able to go up and down unless you change your orientation. Like if we rotated it and hit scale and Y, you'll see it has a new dimension whenever you uh, start messing around within 3D. Similar to the scale function, we can also hit G to grab stuff and hit X or Z to lock the orientation that we're translating our object on. You could also press Y in this to create some pretty cool depth where you just grab part of your object and now suddenly some of it is really far away. Generally, I will create some depth whenever I'm doing grease pencil illustrations, but most of the time I'm translating objects left, right, up and down, not so much forwards and backwards. That's pretty much all there is to edit mode. Next, we can move on to sculpt mode by holding tab, dragging down. With all these tools here on the left, you can see if we hit the grab tool, it grabs the vertices under our brush and you can scale it up and down up here. You can change the strength of it. And if you have a, an actual tablet pen, you can use the pressure sensitivity to change how much you're really sculpting your object by. Finally, we're gonna talk about the main mode in Grease Pencil, which is draw mode. Um, I'm actually going to just delete all of this real quick. Now in draw mode, you can see we have our materials menu up here. We have our brush settings. Uh, generally, I like to turn off the pressure sensitivity because I kind of just like flat lines with flat uh, opacity. I don't really like having a bunch of variation in the stroke. Um, but I do use modifiers, which we'll talk about later on, to uh, create variation in, in stroke density and stuff. Over here we have the pencil tool, which is the base tool that you start with in draw mode. Use it to lay strokes, and you can even use materials with a fill to draw shapes just the same way you would with, with lines. It just fills in as you draw on the lines. Next, if you grab the bucket tool with a fill material selected, you can double click on an area and it'll fill it in with that material. Now you'll see it changed the thickness of our line here. That's because I'm doing it on the same layer. If I switch to my fills layer, you'll see that it, it, it makes the, the fill appear behind the lines. And I can actually hide the lines layer and you can see exactly where the fill went in. But this is where I'm gonna bring up my secret, super secret tip number one, um, which is that I don't think it's a good idea to draw with just the lines in Grease Pencil and then color them in with the bucket tool. If you're making an illustration, it might actually help you out a lot to start by just roughly sketching out whatever you're drawing and then going in with fill materials and blocking out the object like that. Let me give an example of what I'm talking about. So to illustrate my point, I've got these two illustrations of a rough, rough sketch of Pikachu. 
And if I was just drawing the way that I'd kind of first started to learn to draw in grease pencil, I might go in and just fill in this illustration with lines, kind of drawing them one at a time. And then with my line art done, I would go and grab my fill materials and I'd have to go ahead and hide this rough sketch layer because I wouldn't be able to fill in quite right with that layer turned on. With my fill material selected, I grab my bucket tool and I'd start filling in the area of where the colors are supposed to be. And then I'd run into an issue immediately. So that this got covered up. Okay, now I gotta fill that in again. And then I realize I actually need a white layer. And then I fill in those and it's boom. Now we have our drawing. But there's a problem with this. Now that I've finished my Pikachu illustration, if I click it and look at it with the statistics turned on, you'll see that it's made up of 3,503 points, which is a lot for just a simple little <laughs> drawing of a Pikachu like this. And that might not you know, seem like it's really affecting your system or your workflow. If you have a really nice computer, it's probably not going to be inhibited by the amount of geometry you're creating through doing an illustration with the bucket tool like this. But I'm going to show you what happens when we don't use the bucket tool and instead draw with fill materials. Now with my other Pikachu selected, I grab my material that is made up of a black stroke and a yellow fill. I grab my pencil. The way you have to think about it is what is the furthest away? So right now the tail is the furthest away. So I'm going to just draw that first. And boom, I've drawn my shape and it's already filled in with the color. Then I just draw the overall body like this and boom, the body's done. It's all filled in. And then with the same material, I can go ahead and just start adding details like this. You know, all the little lines that are the same color. And then for the ears, I'll grab my black material, just fill in the ear like that. And then I'll grab the white material for the eyes. And then boom, if we turn off the blue, you'll see it is a, another Pikachu. And I'm realizing it doesn't look as cute as the one that I did on the other side, but the difference is really that this is going to probably be a lot lower geometry. Let me just delete my blue strokes. Then if you look at it, this one is only 1,700 points. Now, why is it so much less geometry? That's because this one, whenever we add a fill tool, if I just select the, the object that makes up the fill in this space without proportional editing on, you'll see this is its own object. Like this, these are tons and tons of vertices that the bucket tool creates every time it's trying to fill in a stroke. And you can, I think you can optimize this to where it doesn't generate quite so many, but when, when you're using the fill tool to fill in an illustration, even if it's something simple like this, it's creating a ton of geometry, um, which is why I recommend that if you're making character illustrations like this, you draw with uh, with the sense of the fill material in mind. So when you're going to color a character, you can think of it as laying out the lines for it at the same time you're filling in the color. So rather than thinking of your character as a bunch of lines that create the shapes, you can think of it as a bunch of shapes that create the character. Um, and by doing that, you can save yourself time of having to go switch between materials and filling it in and coloring every single empty space that you create with the lines. Um, and it, it generally is going to create a more cohesive character and it's going to save you a lot of memory in your computer for processing all of this geometry, especially if you're doing things like rigging or weight painting or editing your, your geometry of, of the drawing. Uh, this is something that I've started doing that I've had a lot of fun with. Um, it creates for really cool um, process videos because rather than just seeing like a bunch of lines and sketching and stuff, you see like the whole shape of the character come together. Um, so that's one of my super secret tips that I've been doing is don't draw with just strokes and then fill it in with a bucket tool. Um, sketch out with your strokes and then go get your fill materials with the stroke enabled. Um, and this also does some cool things for us. We can say, okay, well, if we have this yellow, maybe we don't want it to have black lines. Maybe we want it to have more orange lines. And then that's super easy to edit because Blender's material tool is cohesive across the strokes. And yeah, that's, that's just a super cool thing about Grease Pencil that I've started using recently that I have found has helped my illustrating a lot. And it's also optimized uh, my Blender illustrations when I'm doing a lot of super complicated illustrations with a ton of characters. It cuts down on geometry a lot by uh, just drawing with the fill shapes in general rather than focusing on laying out the lines and then coloring. It's also just super fun. Like, look at this. What if I just grab this and I say, I want, this is the little body and this is the little legs. And maybe it's got a little tail and here's some arms and then draw a head, some ears. 
little mouth, and boom, you got your little character. He's a little guy, and he comes together like that. I found that it's very fun for creating colored characters. If you're just doing like regular old black and white illustrations, this might not be a, a method that you want to implement into your workflow, but I think it's very fun. It's very, very intuitive to me and very fun. Man, I feel like I got very off track of the basic tutorial I wanted to talk about. Okay, this video is getting a lot longer than I meant it to be, so we're going to go ahead and jump into the next feature of grease pencil that i'm really excited about which is the modifiers uh, so modifiers are something that takes the geometry of your object and it applies certain effects to manipulate them and you can get to your modifiers by clicking the modifiers properties which is this little wrench here if you just hit add modifier you see there's a huge menu of them and noise modifier is one of my favorites and what it does is it takes your object and it adds a noise map that translates changes the thickness of changes the opacity of all of your geometry um, in your drawing. So position, it's set to like 50 by default. I think that never looks good. I like to bring it down to like 10. And then the noise scale changes how uh, rapid your noise changes. I guess it, it changes the size of the randomly generated values. So if you bring it up a lot, it's going to create a more warbly looking uh, effect. You see uh, just through experimenting with, you can get like a really fuzzy sort of look. And then if you change the thickness, it'll actually change the thickness of your lines a bit, which can look really cool. Um, I like using this just to kind of give my illustrations a little bit more of an etchy sort of look. Um, makes it look a little bit more hand-drawn, um, which I really like. Another great modifier I use a lot is the thickness modifier. This manipulates the thickness of your entire drawing, like every stroke in your entire drawing, which if you end up drawing something a little too small and maybe you want it to have a, a thinner lines to make it look like it, it could be a bigger drawing, um, this is a good way to do that. Um, or you can just make the line super thick for no reason. But yeah, that's, that's another great modifier. And then the last one I want to talk about is the mirror modifier, which is going to take your object and mirror it on whatever axis you want. So this is a... Uh, actually on the x-axis i guess i rotated my object if you ever find yourself in this situation and your stuff is mirroring in a weird way just rotate it however you want and then hit Control a which is going to bring up the supply menu you can just hit all transforms and if i hide this other guy by hitting h you can see it's now uh mirrored on the actual global x-axis i could rotate it again and then hit it again and you see it's going to keep resetting it for me otherwise you just go into edit mode and then you, it'll update in real time like that. However, something that I want to talk about that is my second super secret tip of this video, if I find my drawing pen, you'll notice that when I'm in Grease Pencil and I'm drawing with a mirror modifier turned on, it's not going to update in real time. It's only once you lift your pen up, completing the stroke, that you'll see it update in the mirror. And I love drawing with mirror modifiers. It's really fun uh, being able to see what your drawing looks like mirrored already. Like it's super fun for creating uh, sort of more pattern textured pieces um, rather than just one character illustration or if you were drawing a, a character um, it can be really fun for that as well but if it's not updating in real time it's not going to do a lot for you to see what your mirrored drawing is going to look like um, so i've actually like scoured <laughs> like subreddits and threads trying to figure out how to get around this issue how to make it where you can draw with a mirror modifier in blender and have it update in real time and I just hadn't be, been able to find an answer to it. But one day I was messing around with collection instances, which is a feature in Blender that lets you take an entire collection and duplicate every single object in it and transform the duplication, move it around however you want. And it actually has a really cool application for grease pencil. So what I'm gonna do is we're just gonna, we're gonna create a new grease pencil object. So I'll just create a blank object it's going to open up a, a new whole thing. I can just grab my material that I want to draw with. And with my, in object mode, with my blank uh, grease pencil object selected, I'm going to hit M, which is going to open up a menu to move this object to a new collection. I can hit new collection. We're going to call it symmetry. And then with uh, this object in symmetry, if you see, we could just draw on it. It's not really doing anything. But if we hit shift A and then collection instance, go to symmetry, and then rotate it on the z-axis by 180 degrees, you see we now have a mirrored image of our drawing. And if we select our original drawing, go into object mode, you'll see it's updating in real time. <laughs> and it was so cool to me when I figured out how to do this because I wanted to you know, get an effect like this for so long. But yeah, this is super fun. It's way more intuitive if you're trying to draw a symmetrical character 
But yeah, that's uh, the, the last little super secret tip thing that I have to share. I felt like it was a super huge eureka moment for me. I hope that if you've been looking around for something like this as well, that it helps you. Oh, actually, there is one more modifier we have to talk about, which is the build modifier, which is so fun. Because what it does is it, it Blender is always keeping an index of all of your strokes in the order that you're drawing them. And so if you have a build modifier, you can actually have it build your drawing as uh, the way you drew it. <laughs> and uh, you can even have it shrink to uh, kind of mirror that that animation. So it's undoing your drawing until until it's a, a no more until there's no more drawing. Um, you can also have it do a concurrent mode where it's drawing every single stroke simultaneously, which is also very satisfying to look at. But yeah, that is that is the last uh, modifier I wanted to talk about. Now that we're done with that, um, we're gonna move on to effects, which we don't need to talk about too much. It's just pretty fun. If you go under the modifier menu under effects, you see in the when we click add effect, you'll see a bunch of fun effects that we can add. One of those being pixelate. Bring that up. You have to be in rendered view to actually see what it's doing. Um, you'll see that it pixelates our drawing. And this is going to look kind of blurry because of anti-aliasing being enabled. But if we turn it off, you'll see we get a much chunkier um, look of our drawing. Another fun one is the rim light which is adding a light around our object based on the the borders of it, which gives you this really cool lighting that's totally automatic. It just takes the edges of your object and drags it down. But yeah, and then other than that, we have the glow, which can be very aggressive. You might want to bring it down a bit. And then we want to change the blend mode to add. Then we can change some of the lighting stuff. This would be more dramatic if we change our background color, which you can change the background color of your canvas by going to this world menu. If I just make it black, you'll see our, our guys glowing a little bit more. Another very funky effect is the wave distortion effect, which you can see is literally just distorting our, our uh, drawing. And you can actually animate this. Uh, another super quick tip is uh, if we click the phase you'll see like if we if we're just playing the animation it's not really doing anything um, and i'm going to get rid of this build modifier but with the wave distortion effect here if we click it and hit hashtag that's going to add a driver which allows us to animate this um this effect so we can type frame and then maybe divide it by like 50 so that's going to plug in the frame count of our animation of the current frame and divide it by 50 and that's going to figure out the phase value so if we click that, it looks like 50 is actually way too high. Let's do five. You'll see it's now animating like the little wiggle. What other effects might we want to look at? The blur effect is pretty standard. Um, there's lots of cases you'd want to use a blur. And this is totally animatable. So if you're trying to emulate like a depth of field effect, um, you can just control it like that, keyframe these, which is actually going to move us into the next thing about Blender Grease Pencil that we want to kind of just have a grasp on is keyframing. Because um, if you notice, this whole time we've been working with a timeline, um, and this allows us to have animated stuff happen to our illustrations. Um, but more importantly than that, it controls the keyframes where our drawings exist on. So by default, Blender 2D animation is going to have auto keying enabled, which is controlled by this little button down here. Um, and what that does is if you move along through your illustration and you just start drawing, it's going to create a new keyframe is going to have a, a different drawing on it. Um, and that, you know, might be what you're going for. But if you don't want it to do that every single time you're drawing as your animation is playing, you can just turn off auto keying. And if you accidentally make a keyframe somewhere that you don't want it, you can just select it by dragging, like drag selecting down here and then hit the delete key and it'll delete that keyframe. And if you want to draw as your animation is playing, um, you can go ahead and you know just play your animation, make sure auto keying is off, and then you can just add illustrations to your, your scene as it's playing. But yeah, maybe you do want to add more keyframes. Maybe you want to have a manual control where you're not drawing every single time uh, to add the keyframes. So say I want it to be a different keyframe at frame 20. I can just move my little cursor here that's controlling the, the timeline. And then with my mouse over the scene, I can hit I, and then that's going to bring up this animation menu, which lets you insert a blank keyframe, uh, insert a blank keyframe on all the layers, duplicate the active layer. Sometimes that's important if you want a new uh, scene, but say I want to transform something, like maybe I want these wings to kind of fan out for that specific frame. And, and that's that's a thing you can do. Let's say maybe we want the, the wings to have a little animation. Um, 
you can drag your keyframes around by clicking them. So I'm going to bring this closer. And then you could even select multiple keyframes at a time. And if you have like a slight animation, like these wings opening up like that, you can select all of your frames. If you want them to repeat, you hit Shift D with them selected. And you can just keep doing that and duplicate your frames over and over again. And now we got that fun little animation with the wings opening and closing. You can also change the timeline length of how often your animation loops by changing the start and end frame. So if we want this to end at like frame 75, and now we got a little loop and animation of our bug flapping his wings. That's pretty much the basics of keyframing and how it applies to illustration if you're trying to implement light animation stuff into your, uh, into your Blender grease pencil illustrations. That's all I have to share today. Thanks so much for watching. I hope you got some helpful information from this little tutorial. Sorry, it kind of turned into a big tutorial. I really wasn't uh, meaning for this to turn into a big complicated thing, but I just felt like it was important to elaborate on some stuff to make sure that you guys wouldn't be left with any questions about how I did a particular thing or why does this behave that way or what is the point of using grease pencil in the first place. <laughs> um, I realized that it, it is a pretty daunting uh, illustration tool. But if you're someone that's interested in animation or uh, 3D implementation into illustration, it's really cool to learn Blender. And Grease Pencil is a really awesome application for uh, mixing 2D with 3D and animation techniques across different dimensions. So I think it's super cool. It is very fun for me to work in. So I hope I could share some of that enthusiasm with all of you. If you'd like to support me and check out some more of my Blender breakdown work, consider checking out my Patreon. I also have that little download of my default blender startup file if you want to use it for illustrating in it's already got all my modifiers and the symmetry tool set up right um, and it's just really fun whenever i feel like doodling i just open it up and start drawing right away it's already set up with everything i don't have to worry about adding more materials or finicking with any any settings to get the viewport right or changing the thickness on my stroke or changing the brush settings it's just set up exactly how i like it you can get that on Patreon for free. I'm excited to make some more YouTube videos to share some of my Blender knowledge. I've been using Blender for a couple years now and I still learn something new every day. So I want to do my part to contribute to the pool of Blender knowledge to get more people into it. I hope you'll subscribe if you're into that kind of stuff. If you just want to keep up with my work, you can check out my Instagram. I like to post my art on there whenever I get around to it. That's all for now. Hope you have a good one. Thanks for watching and I'll see you next time. All your stickers are going on.